of House Republicans led by Congressman Steve King of Iowa are holding a press conference in opposition to the Senate's Gang of Eight bipartisan immigration bill. This is just getting underway. ...and comment on what's uh, happening with the immigration issue across the, in the Senate and what's happening in this country. I'm Congressman Steve King. I represent Iowa's 4th Congressional District. And about three or four weeks ago, uh, some of us were in discussion wondering when the conservatives were going to speak up on this amnesty bill that was unfolding in the United States Senate and that was being, uh, I'll say, put together behind the scenes in the House. And uh, Congressman Lou Barletta and I had a conversation on the floor. That started, uh, that started a meeting that we had, and about six people uh, were arrived at that meeting to discuss how we were going to protect and defend the rule of law. Uh, from that time, We've had several other meetings, done a little bit of other press, and also pledged ourselves that we were going to do one minutes, floor speeches, uh, op-eds, press releases, to get the message out that there's another viewpoint. Here, it's not the one that is being stampeded in the, in the Senate and it may be stampeded in the House. And so I would just submit to you that I have said on the Immigration Subcommittee, I'm into my 11th year. I don't know how many have spent more time studying this issue than I have. Uh, there likely are a few. One of them is Lamar Smith, who uh, is the author of the 1996 Immigration Reform Act and uh, just the most recent past chairman of the Judiciary Committee. He sends his regrets. He would very much like to be here. He has a, a pinched nerve in his back that uh, disallows him to be here today, uh, as is the case for Lou Barletta who badly wanted to be here and couldn't make the transportation work out, uh, he'll be passing out a, a letter that he wanted to submit. But, to, but both of those gentlemen wanted to join their support in this press conference. Uh, I would make this point that the 844-page bill over in the Senate, how it, whether it amended or not, in what ways we can anticipate it, it might be, is still is a terrible idea if you look at it from an economic perspective. At no stage in their lives do, does, does the universe of those who would receive amnesty make a net financial contribution to this country. At no stage, not a single year out of all those years. And that's, that's off of Heritage Foundation's report, Robert Rector's report, which many of you be familiar with. It destroys the rule of law. And the rule of law is an essential pillar of American exceptionalism. Many people come here because we have equal justice under the law. If we reward people who break the law, they're unlikely to raise their children to respect it. The rule of law, at least with regard to immigration, it would be destroyed. And the promise that the law would be enforced from this point forward, I don't know how we can listen to that with a straight face. We remember the 86 Amnesty Act, and each Amnesty Act since then, there are about six after that, smaller ones that didn't meet the news so much, and they uh, also were the promises for the next group that would be amnestied. This group of 11.3 million that they're calculating will be bigger than they say. That always has been the case. It was roughly going to be a million in 1986. It became 3 million in 1986. This number will be larger. It's predicted to be something like 33 million by the time you add in the legal and illegal. And I think that number perhaps grows from there. The assimilation that's been an important part of America is a different scenario than we have had in the past. Uh, I've noticed that the people that are for open borders aren't really the embracers of assimilation. And assimilation is what has made America great, the giant melting pot. I'm for that. I want to see people co-mingle and intermingle. I want to see them embrace this thing called cultural continuity. That's the American culture and civilization. They promise about learning English. It's easy to follow through with that promise. Let's just pass the official English bill. They aren't willing to do that because they're not serious. And it doesn't either take into consideration the illegal drugs that come across the southern border. It's a promise to secure the border. Not much of a promise, but a promise. Eighty to ninety percent of the illegal drugs consumed in America come from or through Mexico. That's a problem that needs to be addressed. We can secure this border. I can tell you that I can secure this border with the resources that we have in less than five years if you gave me Janet Napolitano's job and a president that didn't tie my hands. The resources are there. They are not serious. We can't take these people seriously because the people on the other side of the aisle, they want amnesty for a number of reasons. The biggest one, it's a big political boost for them. I don't understand why Republicans think it's a good idea, but somehow they've, they've bought into this, uh, this idea. From a national security standpoint, 
we know that we have large numbers, and those large numbers is a quantifiable number in a way. Some of it's classified, some of it's quantifiable, that flow across the southern border uh, that, uh, that come here to do us harm. And so the big question I would pose out there is why? Why is that 844-page bill, why is it good for America or Americans? I can't get that answer on why it's good for us, but I, perhaps some of my colleagues do have some answers to that. I suspect they have some criticism. And I'd like to first introduce the gentleman from Texas and my good friend, Louis Gomer. Thank you. Appreciate you coming out because this is a very, very critical issue for this country. Uh, we are a land of immigrants, uh, Native Americans, but then the thing I loved that I saw the day after the worst attack in American history as people gathered around in courthouse squares like we did in my hometown, we held hands, we sang together, we prayed together, and as I looked around the circle at all races, creed, color, it, we had it, all types of folks there. But that day, on 9-12 of 2001, there was no hyphenated Americans anywhere. We were all simply Americans. That came from people immigrating and becoming one people. E pluribus unum, out of many, came one people. And that makes us strong. And when we ignore the rule of law, we actually become like countries that many immigrants are fleeing because the rule of law, if it's not observed, then you have chaos. And so you have to come to a country where the rule of law is enforced. The only thing worse is to come and say, now that we're here, we want you to ignore the rule of law that made you a much stronger country than wherever we came from. But then by ignoring the rule of law, you, you disintegrate into the same type of chaos from which these people came. There are, we've, been told there may be a billion, a billion and a half people in the world who would like to come to America. Why? Because we are fair. Overall, we're a, a good people, a fair people, an exceptional country, and we enforce the rule of law across the board. But if we fail to do, to do that, if we say or we have a president and it's not just confined to this president, the last president didn't sufficiently secure the border, but if we have a president who holds hostage his obligation to protect the country and to secure the borders, and be, be sure you understand, nobody behind me or that, that supports our position wants a closed border. Immigration is a, is a, a life spring. It brings additional life and, and ju rejuvenation to this country. It's a good thing. But we have to make sure we don't get overwhelmed by people that want to destroy us. And for those who have made fun of me for, for commenting that we had radical Islamists that came across our border trying to blend in with Hispanics, uh, all they needed to do was get off their lazy rears and do a little research and they'd find out that the director of the FBI has previously testified before our committee that um, uh, you had radical Islamists who adopted uh, Hispanic sounding names, would go to places like Mexico, get uh, identification papers, and then try to blend in as if they were uh, Latin Americans or Hispanic Americans and come across our border. We have an obligation to this country to make sure that those coming in want to be a part of the greatest nation and are willing to assimilate and be be a part and not destructive of this country. And that also includes an enforcement of the visa overstays, which over 40% of the people illegally here apparently have overstayed visas. You had people uh, of Boston who had overstayed visas and yet they were not being checked. And if the FBI does not have the resources to check one individual who Russia has given us a heads up on has radicalized in wanting to harm America, then do you think that the system will be better if we add 11 million more people all of a sudden instantaneously for the FBI to check out and make sure they're not going to be a threat? 
There will be threats involved in that, just as we saw in Boston when we had people who were linked to their terrorists or terrorism uh, that were questioned, and, and even one Saudi that was wanting to be... Um, it is a danger to this country. So let me also say, for a president to say, I'm not going to secure the border, which is his sworn obligation to protect this country, unless you give legal status to millions of people, it does a couple of things. Number one, as I've heard from sheriffs and border patrolmen, it has become a magnet. Some of you have reported, we got three, four, five times more people coming across our border just because of the talk of potential amnesty if they can get over here. And they say, oh yeah, but we'll require proof. Well, in the past, we've seen proof could uh, be composed of an affidavit signed by the individual saying, oh yeah, yeah, I came by the time you said I had to be here. We have to first secure the border so only people lawfully coming in come in. We do need to reform our immigration system. It's pitiful. It shouldn't take longer to get a visa here than it does in a third world country. We're better than that. But for this president to say, I won't secure the border unless you give legal status to all these people would be hypothetically like some random president saying, uh, hey, media, if you don't write good stories, I'm going to be going into your your phone records on a regular basis until you start just hypothetically or like saying, hey, groups, you better get off my back or we're going to harass you with the IRS. Just hypothetically. Now, none of us would stand for that, right? So why should we stand for a president who is saying, I won't secure the border properly until you give legal status? Let's secure the border and then we can work out an immigration package like that. Thank you. Thanks, Louis. Um, next up is John Fleming of Louisiana. Thank you, Steve. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we know that the United States is a nation of immigrants, a nation of, of, of immigration, but it's also a nation of laws. And we are here today to celebrate legal immigration. That is what we should do. However, I completely disagree with the bill that's percolating in the Senate today. You know, it's often said that history is the best determiner of the future. And what has history told us? In 1986, we passed amnesty, and now we have a bigger problem today than we did then because that bill promised amnesty, but it also promised secure borders, and we're yet to see those. Also, I'm told it's 844 pages. When in recent years have we passed such a large bill and had a good outcome? I'll give you Obamacare and Dodd-Frank as good examples of that. Uh, I really think that we need to tear this thing up and start from the beginning. We need to go back, meet in our committees, go through the process, and first and foremost, we should pass a law that secures the borders first. Second, we should pass a law and mesh it with technology to be sure that the 40 percent of unlawful immigrants who are here today as a result of overstays from their visas are properly tracked. Once we do that, I think we can open up a dialogue about what we should do in America today with those who are here unlawfully. But I suggest to you today that it's not through a giant bill that we know is just full of promises and full of contingencies when in fact we're not even fulfilling and enforcing the laws we have today. So I look forward to, me, uh, to working with my colleagues on this side uh, to create some good legislations, bills that we can be proud of. Thank you. And next up to hear a real Arizona position, Dr. Paul Gosar of Arizona. Well, good morning. You know, I always talk, start by com the conversation is trust is a series of promises kept. And so why would we have trust in a big bill that America knows is riddled with problems? What we need to do is we need to have an immigration policy, and it starts with border security, like what you see in Yuma, Arizona. It actually works, and so we need to reward great behavior and em emulate exactly what works. But we also have to look at what, what legal immigration actually works for. I want to make sure that we're in embracing proper legal immigration. 
I'm a product of legal immigration. Both my grandparents came from Europe um, in, through Ellis Island. So we are a great melting pot of, of, of people. The second thing that I would like to say is, is that when we look at the metrics, I think what all Americans want is we've got limited resources. So I'm not very comfortable to having Homeland Security and Janet Napolitano dictating what is border security. I think it's an America feat where we actually use states, right, states uh, federal agencies, and local municipalities to help us. And what we do on our southern border, we do on our northern border, and we do on our ports. It all works together. And last but not least, before we can go anywhere fur further, we have to reform our entitlement programs, because if we don't, we will surely break them with what is being proposed in the Senate. Let's break it up into smaller bills. Let's make sure we air it out in front of the American public. Let's hear their voice. As a physician, as a dentist, what hurts? How do we help? It includes the American public. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, Paul. And and next up is a gentleman, when I first talked to him when he came to this Congress, I, I knew right away he understood the Constitution and the rule of law, and he lives by it, and that's Mo Brooks of, of Alabama. Thank you, Steve. In each of the past five years, 620,000 to 1.05 million foreigners have been given American citizenship. No country on earth comes close to, be as, to being as generous as America is with its citizenship. The immigration issue is not about whether America is compassionate and generous. We are. The immigration issue is about whether America has the financial resources to accept all of the world's immigrants into America. There are hundreds of millions of foreigners who, if they could, would immigrate to America. For example, in April 2013, a Pew Center poll revealed that 20 percent of all Mexicans said they will illegally immigrate to America if they can get away with it, and another 15 percent said they would immigrate to America if they could lawfully do so. That's 38 million people from just one country who want to immigrate to America. America suffers from four consecutive trillion dollar deficits and a soon to be 17 trillion dollar accumulated debt. Unless America changes its financial path, America will suffer a debilitating insolvency and bankruptcy that will usher in one of the worst three or four errors in American history. America's immigration policies must reflect America's dire financial condition. America must limit immigration based on how many immigrants a year our economy can absorb. Two, limit immigrants to net tax producers, i.e. those people who we have confidence in who will generate more in taxes than they consume because they have, these people, viable skill sets that the economy needs. Two, advanced degrees and intellect that can support our medical high-tech and other intellect-driven industries. Or three, financial resources that can help create new jobs and businesses in America. And then finally, and most importantly, we must enforce our immigration laws, whatever the consensus may be in Congress on what they should be. The President and the Senate Gang of Eight push an amnesty bill that fails all of these tests. It gives amnesty to people whose first step on American soil was illegal conduct. It costs American taxpayers a 50-year net tax loss of $6.3 trillion. It does not secure America's borders. It relies on a president who has proven he believes he is above the law and has no intention of securing America's borders or enforcing America's immigration laws. America cannot afford to open massive immigration floodgates any more than it can afford an amnesty plan that rewards illegal conduct while adding $6.3 trillion to America's already dangerous and exploding national debt. A debt, I might add, that is already significantly damaging America's economy and national security. I can't speak for anybody else, but I can speak for myself. I cannot, in good conscience, ratify illegal conduct with my vote. Under no circumstance will I support the President and Senate Gang of Eight's amnesty plan. Thank you. Thank you, Mo. And, uh, and next up is another gentleman from Texas who does stand strong on every issue that he takes a stand on, Steve Stockman. Uh, <clears throat> I think this bill is fundamentally unfair to our friends that are Hispanics that follow the law. It's fundamentally unfair to Lebanese who follow the law. It's, it's fundamental to all the people that came here legally, it's fundamentally unfair to them. They have a gang of eight, we're going to have a gang of millions because you can watch this bill as it processes through the House committees. 
that they will rise up against it and it will fail because the people are stronger than the gang of eight. We have a gang of millions behind us. You will watch this bill is not going to, as it's being exposed in 900 pages, it will fail on its own merit and we're going to stand behind our bill and modify it and make it better and treat treat those that came here legally with respect and decency. We can't tell the people that came here legally, oh, well, you're different. We're going to allow these people to break the rules while you follow the rules. Uh, I'm proud to stand with our colleagues here, and we're going to fight and defend this Constitution. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. i just make a statement here before we turn it over to questions, and that is I want to express to you all how bad this bill is. And some of us have dug down through it and read significant parts of it, and some of us has also gone through the people that have taken it apart piece by piece and title by title, which is going on supposedly over in the Senate. We will not get an open debate on this bill unless we organize an open debate in some other venue than the United States Congress. It'll be, it'll be set up in a different way. We'll get a debate all right here in the, in the House of Representatives, but it won't be an open one that lets us really get down and take it apart piece by piece. But here's my understanding of it. It, it does. It grants amnesty to everybody that's here. It, grants, it sends an invitation to everybody that's been deported in the past and says to them, reapply because it's the really we, we really didn't mean it clause in there. Reapply to come back to the United States. And it is an implicit promise that everybody that comes here after the deadline, if they can get here after the deadline, will also get amnesty. That's the package. Everybody here, everybody deported, everybody that gets here, all are going to get it unless they're convicted of a felony and we'll come across them later. By the way, nobody's coming out of the shadows that doesn't want to come out of the shadows. The people that they think are going to be sorted out by this system, felons are not going to show up to register. Has anybody pointed that out to the Gang of Eight? They're not. They're going to live in the shadows here in the United States. But here's how bad this is. You all know how badly I despise Obamacare. I've spent years of my life fighting against Obamacare. I've stood here many, many times and done that. I despise that bill because it's an unconstitutional takings of our, our bodies, our health, our skin, and everything inside it. It's a terrible, and it diminishes the destiny of America. But if I have to choose between accepting, if I came down to this, if, if it was somehow there was a, an offer that said you're going to get one or the other and you have to choose one, I would take Obamacare and try to live with that before I'd ever accept this amnesty plan because the amnesty plan is far, far worse than Obamacare. That genie cannot be put back in the bottle. We can repeal Obamacare. We can't over time pay, pay for it. We can't over time get back our doctor-patient relationship. But if this amnesty goes through, there's no one doing it. The genie of the left will have escaped from the bottle, and he will be as amorphous as a puff of smoke. You will not get him back in that bottle, and we have to live with this in the American civilization and culture in perpetuity. That's not the thing that was envisioned by Ronald Reagan or our founding fathers. And I remember Ed Meese wrote an article in 2006 that said, if Ronald Reagan had amnesty to do over again, he would not make that same mistake. And I hope that he reiterates that op-ed sometime in this debate. Questions from the panel? Yes, sir. Tell us what examples of some specific things you'd like to see improve the border security, either on the Senate bill or other things, uh, before you would entertain a dialogue on these items. Um, I don't have the, <clears throat> the technical expertise to determine uh, the best way to secure the border or when it's fully secured. Uh, what I would do if, if, if I were on that committee is I would ensure that those who do would testify, would give us that information, we would follow that pathway, and then and only then when we have come to that decision, made that law, and then fully implemented it, would I then move forward on anything uh, dealing with uh, those who are here unlawfully. What about these metrics that they're, they're talking about, measuring like, uh, the uh, success rate in the high traffic. Well, remember what this bill does is it says we're going to get to the secure borders, but right now we're going to take care of the 11 plus million uh, who are here unlawfully, and it's just full of contingencies. It's full of triggers, and I think the goal is 90 percent. That's the goal. Now look, right now our goal is 100 percent protection of the border, and we're not even coming close. So if we're going to lower, lower the bar and create more difficulties and expect somehow we're going to meet even a lower goal. So 
I suggest, again, we go back to the beginning and we say let's raise the bar back up to 100 percent protection of the border, come up with the metrics, follow through on the programs that, as I understand it, have already been in place but never fully implemented, and then and only then do we move forward with anything else, except for, of course, uh, tracking of those who are overstays on their visas. We can do that simultaneously. If I could add on that, uh, we know hyster historically what has worked before. Uh, historically, I'm not a big fan of Woodrow Wilson, but we know that after Pancho Villa came across and uh, killed American families, Woodrow Wilson did secure the border. He put thousands of, of American troops on the border, new thing called National Guard, many of them, and they secured the border. Nobody came across that... Uh, the United States didn't want to cross. It's been done. It can be done. I was with a sheriff last night from Arizona who was saying that very thing. He was part of a reserve unit. They secured their sector. It can be done. And as Steve said earlier, this president has the ability. He has the manpower. He has the money. He just doesn't have the will until uh, he extorts what he wants. Ma'am? Uh, many Republicans in your party have said that Well, I'm incredulous with the conclusion that they drew when the sun came up on the morning on November 7th. They didn't have any data to work with. They just said that Republicans lost that Mitt Romney would be the president-elect on that morning if he just hadn't said two words, self-deport. Is it really that sensitive an issue out here to stand up for the rule of law? And the data that it goes completely contrary to the allegations that they've made. So they're, they've fallen back since they know that uh, this is a huge boon for Democrats. They have known that for a long time. In 2006 or so, on a day about like this, there were tens of thousands over on the west lawn of the Capitol. Teddy Kennedy went out before them and said through an interpreter, a Spanish interpreter, he said, some say report to be deported. I say report to become an American citizen. I saw that live on C-SPAN. I wasn't standing next to him that day. But that was the message, which is we're going to recruit all you folks that we're going to give amnesty to to become Democrats. They know that. They learned that. They are in the process of seeking to establish another monolithic voting block. And that's why they spend tens of millions calling Republicans racist. And somehow the Republicans that are advocating for this completely ignore that fact. And, and so uh, this is, there, there's not a rational approach on the part of them. I cannot unravel that approach. It doesn't make sense to me, and I've asked them a lot. They just say, we have to grant this because it starts a conversation. So they would sacrifice the rule of law on the, on the altar of political expediency for the purposes of starting a conversation that would, would ensure that Republicans don't win another national election, in my view. Do you think that that uh, wait, one second. Let me follow up on your remarks. Now, I don't do what I do based on votes, but if you want to get into the politics and the vote dynamics, I seek the votes of law-abiding American citizens. It doesn't make any difference to me what race they are, what sex they are, where their country of origin is recently, decades ago, or centuries ago. And the American citizens who have elected me to office, to the United States Congress, have done so because I support the rule of law. The American citizens I know, from all backgrounds, they support the rule of law. And that means that you do not sacrifice your principles for political expediency. That is the wrong direction to go. That undermines what has made America a great country. And so I'm going to be doing what I do based on what I think is in the best interest of America, and I'll let the voters decide whether they agree with my approach come the next election. Aren't going to vote for Republicans if you're giving the vote? Uh, absolutely not. The Hispanics that I know in my community, they want people who understand the importance of the rule of law. That's what this is all about more so than anything else. That's why I cannot in good conscience ratify with my vote illegal conduct. Who can, with good conscience, ratify illegal conduct? That does not re represent the principles that have made America what we are. Now, bear in mind, I come back from a legal background. I've also been a prosecutor in Tuscaloosa and a district attorney of Madison County. And I understand 
the importance of enforcing the laws that we pass. If the laws are bad, then change the laws. If we've got bad immigration policy, if we need to have a different matrix in allowing those to come here lawfully, then we do that. But whatever that matrix is, whatever those standards are, you have to enforce it or else you become an open border society and you promote something different than the rule of law, i.e. criminal conduct, and we cannot afford anarchy if we're going to have a democracy. I can add one more thing to that. Uh, yeah. When, in, uh, when we talk about Hispanics, uh, I know they've spent, the Democrats have spent a lot of money trying to vilify us, but the Hispanics I know, generally speaking, have a faith in God, they love their families, and they have a strong work ethic. Those are three things I think made America great that I think have been waning in recent years. So I think the Hispanic culture has so much to bring and can help rejuvenate America. And I have confidence that once uh, people have done the research and see which party stands for what and see which party is more pro-life and, and more pro-family and, and embraces a faith in God, that uh, they'll become Republicans. I have very uh, great confidence that a majority will. So this is not about are you, uh, you know, giving up on Hispanic votes. I, I think that they're going to ultimately be Republicans. But the, this is an issue about are we going to follow the rule of law? Are we going to allow it to be abandoned on the altar of what's best politically? And there's been too many decisions made for that purpose, and I think it's time to make decisions for what's best for America. I go over here. Yes, ma'am. I don't see. I see a lot of border states represented here, but I don't see any Californians. Do you have some Californians who are also supporting? You know, I, I have to look across the roster and see, but we have a lot of rule of law Republicans that stand with us that are here today as well. This number is growing within our conference, and I and I want to say this that, you know, for people to um, and to take on a label and tell it, say that they are conservatives, but they are for a bill that is a $6.3 trillion deficit uh, over that period of time, and a bill that would, would identify clearly that the groups that they would bring in could not make a net financial contribution in any single year. That ought to take care of the conservative side of this. These are House conservatives, but we're for this because of the rule of law. And I want to see I want to see a healthy nation. I've said many times, and I think this is an important point to make. There's a vigor that comes with legal immigration that's unique to America. I could go down through the pillars of American exceptionalism when we can name them: speech, religion, press. It goes on. But there's another pillar of American exceptionalism in addition to the rule of law that we that we talked about here today, and that is American vigor, because this country got the cream of the crop of every donor civilization on the planet. We got the dreamers that saw the Statue of Liberty. They were inspired. They came here and decided they could be what they could become only in America. And so they took greater risks. They sacrificed more when they came here. They didn't squander their opportunities. That's part of this, the equation for American vigor. And then each generation taught that same thing to their children. That's why we are a can-do country. And I don't want to see that destroyed by an idea over here that's, uh, that's being debated in the Senate today that destroys the rule of law. So I think I'm going to have one more question and then wrap it up. Right here, sir. Do you believe the, the House leadership, Chairman Goodlatte, Speaker Boehner, the Speaker, do you believe that they're on your side of this debate or are they on the other side? And if they are on the other side, how are you going to prevent this from uh, becoming law? Well, if they're not on our side, I'd suggest that they are convertibles. And what's going on here today is to help them undergo a conversion. I've worked with Chairman Goodlatte for more than 10 years on two committees, Judiciary and Ag. I know him well. I know how he thinks. And he is a very smart man with a good set of values. Um, he has put out um, a, a proposed an agenda here that would be a one bill, one issue at a time. My concern is what I saw Chris Van Hollen say the other day, that we could pass out of this House one or two or three immigration bills that would be messaged to the Senate. It might be an E-Verify, it might be an Ag Worker, it might be a Guest Worker bill. And once they got sent over to the Senate, if the Senate passes their amnesty bill, I'm concerned that House leadership could appoint a conference committee, and that conference committee could could produce from it some version of the amnesty bill that's in the Senate and send it to the floor, unamendable, an up or down vote, in which case every Democrat would vote for it. It would only take a couple of dozen Republicans.
Republicans, and we could be stuck with a very bad bill on the way to the president. So I'm most concerned about that, and I'll continue to talk about that. But I've got confidence in Bob Goodlatte, especially since I've worked with him so closely. Thanks so much, everybody, for being here. Thank you all, my members and colleagues. Thanks, Don. Thank you, Steve. Yeah.